is. Cool. All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining again once, once more for the Rock and Roll Book Club. Today is Tuesday, May 17th. Um, big shout out and happy birthday to my brother Tony and my friend Sean from Windward Guitars in Canton, New York, who celebrated his birthday, uh, both of whom celebrated their birthdays on Saturday. And to my friend Darren Boyd, who celebrated his, damn it, Darren Boyd, who we had back in January, who celebrated his the day after. So it's been a really good weekend, for a really good uh, month for rock and roll birthdays, including the birthday of, da, 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 da. if you've been tuning into the Rock and Roll Book Club, you'll know that May has been kind of turned into Hamilton, Ontario month. So we could not do Hamilton, Ontario without talking about Teenage Head. Um, and specifically about Jeff Pivier's book, Gods of the Hammer, which was released as a mini, as part of a mini series of appreciation books, folios, I guess you call them, because they're only about 150 pages each. Um, appreciation books that talk about, you know, what one writer loved and just was totally into and why and why they should spread that joy. And this is the great thing about this book is that this isn't really a, this is a biography. It's a band history. It is a book that ha, that talks about a lot of the history and the background of the band Teenage Head. Um, but it's a love letter too. And it's the sweetest love letter in a lot of ways because Jeff Pivier doesn't hold back about how much he loved Teenage Head when he was younger. Um, if you have not, if you're too young to have heard of Teenage Head or you're, you know, still one of those people who are like, oh, I remember them from way back when, but, you know, it's uh, to me, and this is my own little personal love note to Teenage Head is I, after seeing the documentary picture of my face, which I'll provide the link to, for those of you who are in Ontario and in Canada, I'll provide the link in the comments. Um, it is, it was a revelation to see that band again because it was a real reminder of just how much fun rock and roll used to be. Um, I have a blog post coming out on Thursday about these, about like, you know, uh, just asking people about the albums that helped save their sanity during the pandemic. And for me, Teenage Head's Frantic City was one of them because it is balls to the wall, just flat out fun, best played at very, very high volume, probably not particularly politically correct, but people weren't thinking about those sort of things in the back in the day. It's just a lot of fun. And it is interesting because it's also a, an album that doesn't really fit into the whole idea of the sophomore curse because Teenage Hood's first album was released in 1979. Frantic City came out in March of 80, I believe it was. Um, and it's just balls to the wall fun where it's just flat out loud will piss your parents off rock and roll and if you are a parent you probably will go back and listen to those songs and go god you know rock and roll used to be fun. Anyway, getting back to the book. The book is not just a love letter to teenage heads music and you know what that meant to you know, Canadian music as a whole, but it also talked a lot, it talks a lot about, you know, how the punk scene in Canada developed relative to the punk scene in New York City and the punk scene in, in the UK, because each type of punk tended to have different focuses. It didn't, it didn't, it had different angles and different ways of approaching the art itself. And um, for those of you who don't know the story of Teenage Head, basically there are four guys who got together, you know, who were friends as kids and got together as a band in the mid 1970s in Hamilton, Ontario. They all went to the same high school. They all hung out and decided they just wanted to be in a band together. So they all worked together. They worked like hell for about two years from about 75 to 77. And then once the whole punk thing broke in 1977, especially in Toronto, those guys were good to go. They were well rehearsed, they were well practiced, they knew each other in each other's playing styles inside and out. So if something went wrong, they knew exactly how to recover from it and just keep going. And that punk wave died out, but the music, Teenage Head's music never really did until things, and I'm not going to spoil the story if you don't know the story, because you really do have to find out the story. Things started going sideways for them in about late 1980. Um, and it could it's interesting because you could argue that in one hand, they never really recovered from it, but the fact that they've actually still managed to make music for so long and be out there and touring and hitting the road and playing shows live for as long as they have, which is like, it's coming up on damn near 50 years. It's like well over 45, 47, if you don't count, you know, if you're counting the two years of the pandemic when, you know, people couldn't play. Um, 
that takes a hell of a lot of dedication to be going at it for that long. And there are very few bands, probably with the exception of like Rush and Godot, who can still pull that off. Um, and I'm going to go into, I'm, I'm tempted to go into a side tangent about how we don't respect our rock and roll elders, our musical elders in this country, because we have so little regard for music as a whole for in, in Canada. Um, but I think I'll say that from when I'm back in Spain, because I then I can like, you know, get more concrete examples about how they love our culture, their culture, and how we're, you know, very shoddy with our own culture. But anyway, that's digressing. Um, so the book's 136 pages long. It is, um, like I said, a love, a love story, a love letter, uh, a, a band history. But it's nice because it doesn't, one of the other charms of it is that it doesn't try to be impartial. It doesn't try to present both sides of the argument. It is clearly in the court of the band itself and presents that love, that idea of, you know, just how much they, you know, he loves that band and will stick up for them. Um, and just, you know, because it means so much. I don't remember where I read it, but I read a statistic once that, um, and if you, if you know where the statistic is, please put it in the comments, because I, I tried for two hours today and I couldn't find it. But the music that you tend to listen to when you're 13 or 14 is the music that will mark you for the rest of your lives. So you think of about a band, about a band that started in 1975 was very actively gigging up until about 1987, took hiatuses throughout the years and started playing again very actively in 2013. That's a lot of, you know, range. That's a lot of time to, to get out there and, you know, to really influence people. And I think that's really why, you know, Teenage Head should be considered one of the references of, of music in this country. You know, they were the ones who inspired tons of bands like The Pursuit of Happiness, like The Headstones. Um, they had, they influenced a lot of other bands. I've heard, you know, people talk about how, you know, the members of the odds in 5440 were, you know, they, that was the, you know, their reference. And I think it also serves as an interesting argument in favor of CanCon too, because when you start backing up and you think about the bands who were influenced by the Headstones and Headstones were influenced by Teenage Head and Teenage Head were influenced by, you know, the, the Hamilton music scene. That is a really good argument about why CanCon works in the sense of developing something that is our part of our own national identity, even if we don't like it, you can't deny the fact that it's helped to make music in this in this in this country a lot stronger. Um, great things about this book. Uh, it is eminently digestible. Like I said, 136 pages, you can plow through it and you may just plow through it in one day. Um, lots of photos. It is not indifferent. It is clearly in this on the band side and it just, you know, it, it's a love letter. What else do you want from a love letter except pure enthusiasm and a whole lot of anecdotes and, you know, just people chipping in from either side. It's not a perfect biography. I mean, if you wanted something that rounded it out, Liz Worth's Treat Me Like Dirt, which is the oral history of punk rock in Toronto, is a very good compliment to it, as well as um, Sam Sutherland's Perfect Youth, which argues that Teenage Head is by far, hands down, the best band in Canada bar none. Um, you know, all three of them make great complimentary readings for one another. And uh, this is this is actually one of the few books about rock and roll where I own the Kindle copy and I own the physical copy, the Kindle copy so I can take it with me wherever I want. And this one is like the good copy. So it doesn't actually leave the house, which sounds crazy. But, you know, that's the way it goes anyway. So that is uh, a very indifferent and kind of rambling review of. Teenage Heads, uh, The Teenage Head Story, God of the Ham Gods of the Hammer by Jeff Pevere, who's currently teaching in universities, I think. He actually was studied here in Ottawa at Carleton. And for a while, when, you know, back in the days when Shea 106 didn't suck, um, was the culture, co uh, the, the culture commentator correspondent for the five o'clock drive home show. And uh, that's how I remember Jeff Fear. I don't remember him as an author. I just remember him as the guy from the drive home show who had the really neat uh, insights on Shay when I was a kid. So thank you very much for tuning in. Just to let you know, uh, coming up in June, we've got for Rock and Roll Book Club. Um, it's not like, I didn't think, I don't think less of these books because I left them towards the end. It was just, you know, what could get delivered in enough time. So June 7th, Kim Gordon's Girl in a Band. June 21st, 
Dirty Wind Shields by Grant Lawrence, who currently hosts a show on the CBC and who has a new book out as well. Um, Rock and Roll Book Club will not be meeting during July and August. We'll actually start again in probably mid-September because I will not be back from holidays until September 5th. And I'm probably going to be too jet lagged to do this before when I get back. Um, so I do apologize for that. But if you want to get a head start in some of the books that we'll be looking at in the fall, they are in no particular order. Tranny by Laura Jane Grace, written with Dan Ozzy, who was the author of Sellout, who we look, which we looked at back in the winter. A huge tome, but engaging nonetheless if you love punk rock. John Savage's English, England's Dreaming, Sex Pistols and Punk Rock. Um, this is the third copy of this book that I've owned. Um, I just might as well buy John Savage Dinner at this point in time because I have owned so many copies of these books since the first one came out in 1992. And um, Fangirls, Scenes from Modern Music Culture by Hannah Ewens, who I believe is actually an academic from the UK. I found out about this book from um, Caitlin Moran, the British humorist and, and author. And I'm interested in this one because as a con as a contrast between fandom, you know, what's acceptable for guy fandom and what's acceptable for girl fandom. And one of the, the, the main ideas, main arguments of this book is that if you want people who have intimate knowledge of every aspect of any band, you want to ask a fangirl because that person is the person who's going to have the most detailed you know, knowledge of that thing. And yet girl fandom is, is, shot down it's considered to be secondary or like second class because it's a girl thing right and of course we all know how like girl things are like so totally not cool and yeah anyway i'll get on a rip about that when we start looking at that in september or october so thank you very much for tuning in tonight for rock and roll book club if you'd like to look at if you'd like to watch the others in this series um at the end of this video there'll be a pop-up card where you can subscribe to this uh to subscribe to my channel here on youtube and take a look at some of the other videos that are listed as well as um i don't know where i was going that comment sorry i'm rambling again surprise um, oh, something else that I'm hoping to get done this this fall is or this summer is to talk to Tere Estrada, the Mexican blues guitarist. She has written a very significant compendium in history of the history of women in Mexican rock and roll. And um, it is obviously not something that's going to appeal to a generalist audience, but she is a wonderful musicologist and a great talker and a great believer in, in the power of creativity. So I'm hoping that at some point in time during the summer, I'll be able to get her on for a rock and roll book club talk so she can tell us a little about this because the his, you know, the idea that most Canadians have of, of Mexican rock and roll probably doesn't include a lot of women who are playing hard rock. Yet they exist, and this is the book that, that details that. Anyway, thanks very much for tuning in to Rock and Roll Book Club for another two weeks. See you back here in two weeks. Yes, two weeks for Kim Gordon. And in the meantime, read on, rock on, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon.